My name is Narani Nipuno and I work for Netnode. We're a technical internet uh, infrastructure organisation based in Sweden and Mark and I will be moderating the session. Uh, so the name of the session is Security Through Multi-Stakeholder Cooperation. So the aim of the session is to explore um, basically all the components in this internet ecosystem um, and different roles when it comes to uh, ensuring security and the various aspects of security. So we have uh, a great panel today. We have four people here physically present and we have one uh, participating remotely and we want it to be an interactive session. So feel free to stand up and maybe not throw things but throw questions at us. Um, so I'm just going to say who we have on the panel um, and then um, Mark is going to give a so quick introduction. Say who we have on the panel um, and then um, Mark is going to give a so quick that wasn't just me, right? No. <laughs> so I'm just going to mention the names of who we have on the panel. Mark is going to give a quick introduction and sort of set the scene a little bit. And then I'm going to throw a few introductory questions to the panelists. So when you introduce yourself and tell us about all the various different hats and roles you have, maybe you can also try to say a few words about those questions. Okay, so we have Pete Resnick, we have Meriki Kao, uh, we have Konstantinos Kumaitis, and Robert Guerra, and then participating remotely, we have Tatiana Tropina. So, Marco. Yes, thank you. Um, yeah, so before we uh, have the panelists introduce themselves and then to explain a bit on, on, on why they're in the panel, just, just a quick sketch of the landscape we're operating in is this as this uh, multi-stakeholder and we, we hope we found people from, from multiple stakeholders on this panel. So um, in, in, in the security landscape and, and it's quite broad and, and a lot of people involved. So of course we've got the, 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 the standardization organizations with, with in, in internet terms the ITF uh, being, being one of the, 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 the leads there in, and of course in ITF there's a lot of security work being done in developing protocols to be secure and essentially it, it, it's always considered security by design. Uh, of course they're not alone in this field. We've got the, the W3C and IEEE equally, equally involved and, and coming from the same, the same area in, in the technical community in, in, in building secure standards and, and uh, offering people uh, that, that line of work. Um, of course, in technical community, the operators there to, to implement those, those technical standards, that, that's where it all starts. And uh, not only they're the ones implementing the standards, but, but from basically the early start of the internet, they were also involved in, in, in making secure and, and responding to incidents. And if you think, for instance, in anti-spam and everything that sort of grew into the operational community and then as that, that role got bigger and more important, we saw within the industry specific organizations cooperating uh, on, on this area and exchanging information to uh, deal with incidents, to deal with certain forms of abuse, uh, exchange, exchanging experience and together coming up with solutions. And, and from that you've seen things like Tim, Team Cymru, um, MOAC, dedicated industry bodies that, that, that talk about security, but of course also uh, groups like RIPE or, or NANOC, they've got security tracks, they've got a anti-abuse working group and, and things like that. So there's, there's huge participation from, from the technical community and of course, on, 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 well, I'm, I'm inclined to say the other side, but it's, that's, we're looking at corporation here. But, but from public sector, of course, the traditional sense, law enforcement, always involved in security. And, and um, of course, when things I illegal happen, ultimately you need law enforcement there to take action. But also, more recently, more dedicated units, more dedicated teams that focus on cyber security, cyber defense. Etc. Uh, and 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 again, there you see cooperation in, in national levels, cooperations in international levels. Now, unfortunately, we 
uh, were expecting a, a participant from Interpol, but he uh, he can't uh, he can't join us uh, for now. Uh, and and then somewhere in between, I think I think are the search where you uh, see see a good example of, of public private cooperation where search com incident response teams uh, that again are, are primarily focused on exchanging data and, and and rapid action. The moment you see something happening, often on the internet, what what's vital is that you take action immediately. You want to get, if you see a host spreading viruses, you want to take it offline. If you see some malware being distributed, you want to act upon it. You want to update your virus scanners, etc. And 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 so so this this just to introduce a bit of the field of the players and uh, I can keep going. Uh, more recently what we also see is, is uh, yeah, what I would describe as, as data or information clearing houses. So may have heard of the, the ACDC project that's, uh, that's being funded by the EU and, and started off in Germany in exchanging information about it. Uh, uh, more local initiatives like the Dutch Abusex all sort of try to bring together different groups and, and exchanging information and, and together trying to make the, uh, the internet a secure place. And uh, that's sort of the, the, the take we want to have for this uh, workshop is to uh, Let's see how we can further enhance that cooperation. So I'll uh, leave it now, I think, to uh, Nirani to uh, coordinate the panel introductions. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, we're not going to hog this space because so, we've got actual experts here. But, but um, so let's mark them up that a few, few of the efforts. And, and we're hoping that this will be an educational panel because we find that security is such a big bucket of, of things. Uh, and it's hard to talk about security as just one thing, so unless you go in and speak about specific issues. But also when doing so, it might be good to know about what, exact, what existing efforts are going on, because there's a lot of work going on in various parts of, of uh, the internet community. So we're hoping that the panelists, kind of as, as in their different roles, can contribute there. So as we know, the internet has grown phenomenally, phenomenally since its start from this very small research network to a network of two and a half billion users. There'll be another billion users in 2017. That's mind-boggling. That's a few years away, four years away, and there'll be one more billion users. 8.2 global, uh, billion global mobile connections, and alone in China, India, and Indonesia, although there will be three billion connections. Uh, and Africa will be the fastest growing region. So clearly, you know, the internet has, has face challenges in terms of growth, uh, certainly in terms of security and, and um, et cetera, in the past. So it's a system that's going to have to continue to evolve. Uh, so what I'd like to ask the, the, the panelists, as I ask you to introduce yourself, is, is so first of all, what do we mean with security? You know, so let's, let's, if we're going to talk about security, let's try to go into specifics. It's a, often a very broadly used term. Is, 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 um, can be entertaining to talk about, but it's, it's, uh, it's not until you go into the specifics that's, that it's um, helpful. You know, are we talking about someone losing their passwords? Are we talking about spam? Are we talking about DDoS attacks, architectural uh, vulnerabilities? So for you, what do you see as the most, um, the most Im important security questions that you'd like to raise now? Are there work that you, that's ongoing that you think is good and you'd like to share, uh, or challenges that we need to address? What is your role in this? In what way are you involved in this? And also, um, what can other stakeholders in the, this ecosystem do to contribute? Where do you see that there's a need for, for some of the stakeholders to talk to each other where they might not be doing so at the moment? So those three questions. Hello, I'm Pete Resnick. Um, I always have this problem with which hat I'm wearing today. Um, I am an employee of a company called Qualcomm, for which I do scant little work lately. I am the Applications Area Director at the IETF, which means that I'm sort of out of the direct security business at the IETF. I'm not a cryptography expert or a secure protocol expert, but I am, in effect, uh, leading the area that uses all of that security infrastructure. And then on the side, 
uh, well, my involvement originally in the IETF was through electronic mail protocols, so I've had some uh, experience with spam and other aspects of unsolicited commercial email. So Narani asked what I view security as and, and um, what are the most important security questions. Yari Arko, in his introductory remarks at the opening ceremony, said something that I thought was very poignant, um, that when it comes to the protocols we use on the Internet, the IETF tends to build things with security off by default. That is, it is an explicit action that we take to turn the security features of our protocols on when we decide that's important. We go to a website and we say we want to use HTTPS, secure HTTP that is encrypted only when we're going to our bank or something that deserves security. When we use email, it is almost always in the clear. It is plain text and we only use encryption in the most extreme of circumstances. Um, and I would venture a guess that most people in this room, including myself, don't use encrypted email most of the time, let alone signed email, uh, in cryptographically signed. And I think when I think about those important security questions, I'm thinking about do we want to change those assumptions? Do we want to start moving in a way that makes us use security, use those secure protocols as a default way of dealing with the world? Um, and some of the reason we don't do that is I think for a basic principle that we in the IETF and, and a lot of the technical folks have sort of made the perfect the enemy of the good. We tend to build protocols where we want to be absolutely sure they're secure instead of, and we can talk about this as the discussion goes on, building protocols where you get a good amount of security and if you need perfection, we give you the ability to do that but if you don't, you still get some good amount of security out of it. And so I think those are the topics that I've been thinking about lately and that folks in the IETF have been thinking about quite a bit. Um, I could go on forever, so I'll, I'll leave more to the discussion. Thank you. Um, my name is Medica Keo, and I currently have the title of security evangelist at a company called Internet Identity, also known as IID, who has been primarily for over a decade doing phishing takedowns and also is uh, managing threat intelligence for people um, and is very much uh, involved in data sharing. Um, personally, I've been involved in many various aspects. So I used to build networks. I used to work for a vendor and actually wrote a book on how to create secure networks. Um, it's a Cisco Press book. And um, I've also helped educate a lot of uh, global constituents about what does security mean in their environments. Um, I'm also currently on the Security Advisory Council for ICANN. And so when I look at security and what does it actually mean, um, it's, it's, it's a hard um, thing to define in a very clear manner because there's so many aspects to it. So if you look at it from businesses or critical infrastructure, it's really about risk management. And the thing with security is that it encompasses absolutely everything um, that deals with um, uh, electronic data. So it comes down to the physical aspects, right? Who has access to the physical equipment rooms or the devices themselves? And then also it, it speaks to a large number of areas in terms of access control. How do you authenticate somebody? Um, you know, do you want uh, uh, integrity, which means that if I'm sending data to somebody that nobody could take the data and change it en route? Do I want confidentiality and privacy? And what do you do with auditing? So the process of actually looking at all of that is everything that encompasses quote unquote security, which I really look at risk management. And then if I look at it from a technical perspective, um, it's really when you're creating protocols, what you're trying to do is you're mitigating, you're trying to mitigate um, abusive behavior from uh, a, a technology um, a protocol level or technology level 
with trade-offs for performance and usability. And the reason why you don't always ship everything with you know, encryption on and, and all the security functionality is because there are trade-offs with performance and usability. So you have to take all of that into account. Good afternoon. My name is uh, Konstantinos Pomaitis, and I am a policy advisor at the Internet Society. And, uh, I am not uh, a techie, but I am in great company, so I feel quite secure. Um, I, my previously, uh, before I joined the Internet Society, I used to be an academic working uh, especially in the field of um, regulation, and partly uh, of the reason why I think I am here is to talk about the challenges of actually uh, regulation in the context of the Internet um, and about this multi-stakeholder framework that we keep referring to, especially uh, in relation to uh, uh, security issues. Uh, so concerning the definition of security, I will not even attempt to provide uh, a technical definition. I think that uh, what we can identify is that uh, security as uh, a concept is in constant transition, it changes all the time, uh, thus our understandings about security change all the time because they get carried away, if you want, uh, from technology and the challenges that we see. Um, and what we also know is the fact that uh, the landscape um, covered by the term cybersecurity includes many types of problems and it certainly uh, includes even greater number of solutions. Uh, and some of, them, of these solutions can be found in the technical sphere, and I'm sure that uh, Pete and um, I'm sure our, our techies will speak about it, and also can be solved through education, through policy, um, or through regulation. However, uh, at the same time, it is very important to understand that regulation is not always uh, the answer and I, I, it is very tempting and I understand the need uh, of the nation state if you want to, 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 to proceed to regulatory frameworks uh, in relation to, to security. However, because of the, the fast evolving uh, and the fast paced actually um, changes that we see, we really need at the same time to be very cautious. And, uh, uh, I really think that uh, cooperation and, uh, and shared responsibility is crucial in the context of uh, security issues. We, we are all part of the network. I mean, for me, security, for example, a couple of, year, a couple of years ago only included passwords, and somebody stealing my password. I'm, still, I'm sure that this is not even now a basic, I mean, it's a stupid way of thinking of things. Uh, but a lot of people do not know what are the security risks. They don't realize what they're uh, engaging in when they're using the Internet. Uh, and I'm not talking about first-time users. I'm, I'm even referring to users like myself who have been using the Internet for many, many years. So it is very important that there is a consistent and coherent dialogue that takes place uh, in the context of security. Because of the technical difficulties and the complexity, uh, we need to start bringing together uh, closer the communities that are dealing with uh, security issues. Pete mentioned the ITF. The Internet Society provides the institutional home to the ITF, and there is a lot of work being done here. That, um, that it doesn't get uh, the exposure, if you want, that it should be getting, not only at the level of users, but also at the level of policymakers. So uh, I will stop here by t uh, and just want to say that, you know, as a first step, let's start focusing on the cooperation and, of course, we will continue this discussion. Thank you. So, good afternoon, everyone. My name is uh, Robert Guerra. I'm with uh, Citizen Lab um, from the University of Toronto. Uh, for those of you not familiar with the Citizen Lab, um, I can speak in more detail. Suffice it to say that it's an interdisciplinary laboratory that's working at the nexus of ICTs, human rights, and global security. It's kind of my institutional hat. I've long before then been working on issues of, um, you could say, kind of digital security for um, human rights organizations and kind of NGOs. Um, 
And so that's kind of the framing in terms of the, what I would say, kind of the least resourced um, actor um, maybe at the table um, that um, works on slightly different issues, but also is using technology and, and using very sensitive data. Um, in, terms of, um, um, in terms of the definition, I'll, I'll based on the, the type of stakeholders or the, the subtypes of stakeholders, which are groups that are really working with, at times, sensitive data for a variety of reasons. They can be for legal cases. They can be for corruption cases. A lot of times it's data that, if in the wrong hands, could um, lead to serious consequences on people's um, lives. Then if one uses the definition from that perspective, it could be security for them is making sure that when they use technology and the internet that they can be safe from harm, safe from danger, and they can be protected in, in either w with protocols or with uh, procedures in place to make sure that stays safe and confidential. Um, in terms of the, the role of the Citizen Lab, as I mentioned earlier, um, it does work on, on, on a couple of different things, but on, in this context is uh, we've been working for many years on uh, advanced research on cybersecurity, particularly malware. Um, we were one of the first, uh, we had a seminal study several years ago that discovered um, that the um, office of His Holiness the Dalai Lama was infected by malware, but so were a variety of different governments, companies around the world, and this made headlines in the New York Times and many other press. And so we've been really following how this least resourced actor gets attacked, and so we study and we work with a variety of organizations, do forensics analysis ourselves. Um, and, and the importance to that, I think, is kind of how we can contribute, is that a lot of times there are a lot of assumptions in terms of what the challenges different organizations are. There's a lot of training that takes place for NGOs. Um, U.S. alone spent well over $150 million supporting such initiatives, but where's the data? Where's the research to try to drive that? And so we, in our humble way, um, try to do that, and we'll be coming out with a report later this year. So I think the, the importance there is what I would say is, is um, working on, on research-based policy and um, getting into the question in terms of how, um, so how I contribute, well, it's the organization kind of works with a variety of different sectors and because we're at a university, um, we do something that um, governments and many others can do is we help convene and we help try to bring different stakeholders together. Um, in terms of what I see the major issue right now, um, I think it varies. Had you asked me six months ago, I would say targeted threats and the, the, the huge um, growth of the zero-day flaw uh, industry. Um, I think uh, after the revelations of, of the summer, um, I think it's the erosion of trust um, and the changing in terms of um, the issue of certs came up earlier. Um, what we heard um, earlier in the sessions, um, uh, I think yesterday at the IGF, is uh, because of national security, um, that trust is not as real time, the conversations is real time, there's a lot of national security agencies that are now being involved in certs more, and a lot more vulnerabilities are, are uh, I think, um, in the system. Um, and um, I think another thing in terms of how we contribute, we've been um, discussing over the last couple of months recently in terms of that it's really important to bridge um, um, and create bridges between the technical community um, and the um, NGO or research community as well. So um, we've been saying that, and you put me on a panel that bridges the technical uh, community and the research community, and the, comp and the IGF is about bridging. So um, I'll leave it with that and um, look forward to the conversation. Okay. Um. We've got, uh, in the meantime, we've got our second remote panelists, which I'll introduce in a second, but uh, I'll leave uh, to Tatjana now. Uh, Tonya, if you can still hear me. You can in briefly introduce yourself. We can see you, but we can't hear you just yet. She is speaking. Tanya, I can't hear you. Can Tanya, I can't hear you. Tanya, I can't hear you. Tanya, I can't hear you. Uh, 
Okay, 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 okay. Um, hmm, this this goes nowhere. Um, okay, 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 okay. Yeah. Um, uh, okay. Apart apart from uh, that, we're that we're right on track in building. I uh, probably the next rage in in music. Um, may may I suggest that uh, that our remote panelists use the chat and uh, hopefully Chris can relay stuff without without echoing. Um, so um. Who do we have online? Well, we've got uh, Tatiana online from the Max Planck Institute, and uh, the other one who joined and already admitted that he had audio problems is uh, Kimo, uh, who works in the outreach department of Interpol. Uh, maybe you both can give a brief, uh, brief opening statement uh, on chat, and uh, we'll have and we'll come back as soon as uh, as soon as Chris has them in. Is that if that's okay? Uh, <laughs> shall we uh, just uh, just kick off? Your question? Yeah. All right, so I have a few questions uh, that I think a few people touched upon. Uh, so, so um, one is this multi-state. You can't say that you, you're not into multi-stakeholderism, right? It's like swearing in, in, in church. Of course we're into multi-stakeholderism. But, but um, aren't there challenges with that, really? I mean, uh, security is, is a really complex thing. Sometimes you need speedy responses. What's good about multi-stakeholderism is that you get several different views, but it's not always the most efficient process. And I think anyone who's been involved with the IGF knows that it's about, um, yeah, it's, it can be quite a painful process. Uh, do we really need that? Isn't it better if, if we leave it to one, one party to, to fix these things for us? I'm, I'm happy to jump into the fray, because as... as um Constantinos was talking about this, I was scribbling some notes. One of the things that I think is really important about the multi-stakeholder model is that you're bringing together not just people with different stakes, wh which is, uh, of course, definitionally true, but different expertise. So the technical community really has scant little expertise in what it is to make a proper regulation and how to enforce those laws. The government has scant little uh, uh, expertise in the technology and maybe even at different levels what the business community needs out of security. One of the things that, and we've seen in both directions, one of the things that we run into trouble with is that we either jump into each other's pools or we expect the other uh, group, the other stakeholder, to take care of everything. And I think neither is useful. So, for instance, government needs to understand when they're making a regulation what technologies are available and needs to know what they can address and what they can't. And going to the IETF, for instance, and saying, why haven't you solved the spam problem? Why haven't you solved the botnet problem? Is, of course, a little silly to us in the technology community. The answer is because we can't. You're, you're, you're missing, we can provide you tools and those tools can help a lot, but someone else has to provide the economic incentives, the regulations, the, the rest of the things that go with that. So I think, yes, there is a problem with trying to make a decision collectively as a multi-stakeholder group, but understanding each of the group's individual, each of the stakeholders' individual expertise and using those strengths is the way to accomplish that. Whatever happened to women first. <laughs> but um, yeah, I, I will actually uh, want to make two comments here. I absolutely agree with my colleague Pete here about um, the multi-stakeholder model just absolutely needs to happen. I mean, what is quite interesting is that, you know, lawyers spend many, many years understanding, you know, the legal frameworks and their policies. Technical people spent many, many, many years understanding the fundamentals of the technologies and, you know, creating them. Um, uh, you know, politicians, same thing. And so we all have our fields of expertise. And I think sometimes the challenge is having the patience to understand each other's viewpoints, right? And you can always say, oh, they don't get it, they don't get me. But, you know, it's okay, right? I mean, what I have found uh, personally is that I have learned a lot about human rights issues, you know, some of the legislative issues that varying geographic areas have to deal with. 
and that's, ex uh, that's another point that is extremely challenging from a security perspective when you start talking about different geographic areas because different countries have different laws, you know, sometimes tied to, you know, cultural issues. And so even, you know, trying to figure out what is actually cybercrime across different countries may be challenging as a definition. So I think bringing together the multi-stakeholder model, it's we're educating each other on all of these issues. And then collectively, in some forms, we have to come to some kind of agreement in terms of what is best for all of us. You know, we're not going to have the absolute total solution, but step by step, ho hopefully we'll get there. And, you know, that's, um, I think the model so far is really working. And this is my very first Internet Governance Forum meeting. And I can say I've learned a lot already. So, What's the alternative if it's not multi-stakeholder? And the alternative is traditional regulation. And um, w we have already seen that this is really not working in the context of the internet. So that, that's the first thing. Uh, because, and it's not working because the nation state, as an entity, really wants to preserve what they feel uh, are their priorities. And the priorities of one country are not necessarily the priorities of the other country. And the understanding of security of one country is not necessarily the same as the un understanding of security of the other country. So regulation uh, and hard regulation, we are referring to this traditional uh, form of regulation, has the tendency of being trapped, and it should be, um, on subjectivity and be based on national needs. And we're talking here about the Internet, which is global. The second thing, multi so. The, by default, we are thinking of multi-stakeholder uh, uh, governance structures and arrangements to discuss those issues. But we also need to understand that just because we mention multi-stakeholderism, it doesn't mean that automatically we get solutions. Multi-stakeholderism is not an all-inclusive concept, and it doesn't, it, it doesn't come with a magic wand that we just wave and suddenly everything is fixed. But one of the great things that it does is that it brings people together that share a common value. And through this common value, they share also responsibility. And in the context of the Internet and multi-stakeholder, this nexus uh, is the fact this common value is preserving the Internet. It's preserving the open and interoperable and the generative nature of the Internet. And this is a pretty good starting point to bring parties together as uh, we've just heard, and actually make them uh, sit down and work with one another. Because there is a lot, uh, and governments do not necessarily get it. And I hear it all the time, uh, but in my response, my automatic response is, because I am a policy person, why should they, to begin with? Uh, the same way that the technical community doesn't really understand the way regulation and policy making is working, governments we, we cannot expect governments to automatically understand the, the challenges, the technical especially challenges surrounding security. And that's why we need the technical community to come and explain what these challenges are. Uh, we saw this happening, and we, unless we start working together, we will see this happening all the time. Just, you know, a little bit out of security, a very clear example has been in the context of digital content and IPR. Suddenly we saw laws coming about that were endangering the Internet simply, well, the nature and the architecture of the Internet, simply because policymakers did not understand what those challenges were. So we really need uh, multi-stakeholder participation. I know it's slow, I know it's occasionally tedious, and I know it's, it can be very frustrating. But the alternative positions, I personally believe, are... Uh, may lead us to paths that might be more challenging and tricky than what we're facing now. So I may be a little bit of a devil's advocate here. Um, I'm a, a, a supporter of the multi-stakeholder model, um, but I think we've been talking about it since the very first IGF, and kind of where are we, and um, what are some of the, the, the challenges. So I think that in an ideal world, I would say, and I hate to use this word, in a kumbaya world, um, 
you know, we're all talking about multi-stakeholder, and it means that we can all come to the table, even though we have um, different views and different ideas, you say the word, and magically we all talk together. Um, we've been talking together for six or seven years, and in some cases, um, that then comes back at a national and regional level, and it causes, um, it, it, it creates a window of opportunity for dialogue and conversation. Um, so I think that's, that's a good thing. But let's not forget there are other factors and other tendencies also that are pushing back, not against the multi-stakeholder model, um, but national security is the big elephant in the room, as was discussed in the high-level meeting and throughout as well, too. And I think where we, we need to see that is that there are a lot of great challenges to make the uh, multi-stakeholder model work. We just can't invoke it. And so I think what um, organizations here, and I would say a recommendation going forward, is we have to practice what we preach. If we're saying that we're going to be working together with different stakeholders, then the technical sector, the government, um, um, and, and, and the one stakeholder group that has not been mentioned by my previous colleagues is the civil society, um, other Constantinos, but everyone else also needs to work together. And they're all at very different skill levels. So practical things, whether it's Skillshare, um, it's not just inviting folks here. I mean, so for example, from a research perspective, what we do is we've realized there's been a gap. Um, that some of the research that we do around malware or attacks um, um, realize that there is a great wealth of knowledge, but also analytical tools and an approach that would help us understand what we're doing. And I would say the flip side for the technical community, um, if how a tool is going to be deployed or if you see certain tra uh, traffic taking place, if you, if you had a better sense of the context, um, you would realize. So I'm just remembering um, something from a conversation or a discussion on the ESSAC list about a week ago is there was a whole issue with the Qatari top-level domain kind of went down. And for a long time, everyone was talking about, oh, it's down, and just kind of a reaction around it. And I think other communities in the t or other parts of the technical community were talking the same thing. Had we been looking at this in a multi-stakeholder lens, we would have realized that was a set of geopolitical events taking place at the same time and that there was a context that was fueling that. And so that but would have better understood, you know, that it had to do with something far more nuanced and complex. So I think, you know, that, that needs to be there. So, uh, you know, I'll finish and it thinks that the challenge is, is that we have to put it into practice. And um, it's hard. And it has to make, and there has to be a way to audit. And I would say, so the role of government might be to enforce the multi-stakeholder model. I'll, I'll challenge that because in a lot of places that's not taking place, it may be a regulation that says, yes, all the stakeholders have to get together. And if you don't, then don't call it multi-stakeholder. Just call it a, a, a meeting of private sector and the government. Yeah, thank you, Robert. Uh, I believe we've got some comments from our uh, online panelists, uh, Chris. Um, so we do have two online panellists who are having trouble hearing um, the audio and seeing the video <laughs> but are bravely following the transcript live. Um, so this is a bit out of, out of order of discussion but they've both asked me to read their introductory statements here. Um, so first is Kimo Ukunimi and he says, Hello everyone, my name is Kilo, Kimo Ukunimi and I'm working in Interpol Global Complex for Innovation in Singapore. IGCI is the only global law enforcement organization responsible for supporting cybercrime investigation. I'm Assistant Director of Strategy and Outreach and my subdirectorate is responsible for all the public-private partnerships regarding cybersecurity in Interpol. And then uh, Tatiana Tropina, as her opening sta statement, wanted to say, so about multi-stakeholder models in cybersecurity, I think we need to understand that there are several pil fields or pillars of cybersecurity, and depending on the pillar, the players' interactions between them would be very different. For me, those pillars are cybercrime, prevention, detection invest and investigation, critical information infrastructure protection, and national security. We will have different models in each area, though they do overlap. I doubt that we can extend what we have already achieved in multi-stakeholder cooperation in fighting cybercrime. We cannot achieve the same cooperation in national security issues where fewer stakeholders are participating and governments are not willing to collaborate but rather to regulate. And because of the blurring borders between these areas and the absence of clear legal frameworks, 
we have some grey areas and problems with trust between governments, industry and civil society. So basically I wanted to say that the cooperation and participation of different stakeholders will depend on the area we are operating in and if in some areas governments would be willing to collaborate, in others we will have rather have strict requirements, security clearances, regulation, lack of transparency and trust and possible abuse. Thank you. And I was about to ask because uh, to Const Constantinos and, and it's a nice, nice one that Tatiana exactly what you you mentioned. You 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 you, you sort of drop the drop the word trust into into your 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 statement and and not Tatiana is make it make it much clearer is that yes uh, we, we cannot expect governments to understand everything and we cannot uh, we cannot expect them to to solve everything at the, and at the same time Pete in his opening statement you said like yeah and then the default behavior at the ITF uh, was to uh, by default switch security off and and and, and as, as Yari mentioned in his opening statement that that that's likely to change but uh, what 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 can we do, or what what should be done, or where can we do, where can we go in in in, in restoring the trust? Or is 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 there a need to restore the trust in in this uh, in this field? There's something. Uh, I'm trying to collect together a couple of different threads here, because some folks did set this up as the technical community versus, or most communities even, versus the government community. And I don't think that's exactly the only opposition. So let's talk about that security on by default. There are loads of interesting ways technically that we can address things like people snooping at our traffic, including governments, but those, thing, those technical solutions have very interesting consequences, not just for governments, and not, but also for businesses and for the civil society. So for instance, it would be very straightforward for us to re-jigger the protocols so that all electronic mail was end-to-end -end encrypted by default. And yes, there could be man in the middle attacks where people can sniff at that stuff, but we could start out with the bar being quite high. There's a problem. First of all, there are some governments who are happy to have that security on by default so long as it's not their ability to sniff their own citizens' email. Um, so yes, the governments probably have some of their own stake that they're worried about there. But for instance, think about Google's business model. Everybody with a Gmail account, that email becomes part of Google's very important data to figure out what they can give you advertising for. Well, if we start saying to Google, all of the email is going to be end-to-end -end encrypted from the user to their destination, and you at Google don't get to see the contents of that email, that changes an entire business model. Think about the companies that track their employees' email. And if things started getting encrypted end to end, the companies would not be able to, by default, see their employees' email. Um, and does civil society really want to go all the way down that path? Many people like the idea that they are having um, some of this information from other people generally, not from themselves, reviewed by government agencies to see if there is terrorism going on that is being that for which email is being used. Um, there are civil liberties issues that are clearly at stake here. So I, I think we want to be careful, A, about pointing to one particular stakeholder, but also be concerned that these things are um, doing the kinds of things technically that we could do might start to wash over into all of the stakeholders in very interesting ways. So 
just a, a quick follow-up in, in the, the work that, that we've done in the Citizen Lab and I've done around digital security for NGOs. The simplistic view, and that's what a lot of the funding was uh, a couple of years back, was all around kind of just secure email or just secure browsing, and it totally disregarded habits. Um, it, it totally disregarded the change in the threat landscape moving from surveillance to targeted malware. You can have the most sophisticated end-to-end -end encryption system, but if you have a target malware zero-day um, exploit in your computer, they'll see everything. And so I, I, I think what the, the technical community, and, and, and I would say you know, government and private sector, they have their best practices in regards to non-digital security issues and being able to have the different groups actually share those best practices. I mean, one thing that I didn't mention in terms of the, the big challenge for the multi-stakeholder model is actually the culture and the language of each of the different stakeholders is very, very different at times, and to build trust, uh, to be able just to talk. So you can, have, you can tell everyone, go in the room and talk, but if they're having a different discourse, um, you know, some of the, um, and, and even the internet governance community as well. I mean, someone, imagine someone coming new to the um, IGF or to an ICANN meeting for the first time, the, num the amount of acronyms alone uh, is, is, is incredible, IETF with all the RFCs um, even more so. So I think what we can do is we can realize that, that, is, that th that's a challenge and in our own stakeholder groups we've been working on that and trying to figure out ways to, 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 sh to, to share that and I, you know, uh, something that, that, that might be possible is are there mentors on one stakeholder group to the other that could be useful, some of the outreach efforts. again. There's probably a lot of stuff that's already been done, and I would say for, for the email, um, you know, it, 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 I, I can't agree with you more in terms of that being a simplistic view, but sometimes the simplistic message wins the day, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. and it, it, it creates a false sense of security, and that we've seen um, particularly, um, you know, in the, great, in the developments not, over, not only over the last six months, but since all the, I would say, kind of the uprisings in the Middle East over the last couple of years is, that false sense of security has led people to communicate on a variety of different platforms, and then they've been shocked when they realize when they've been picked up, taken up to court, and their complete transcripts of all their chats have been presented to them as evidence, and they've had to spend 50 plus years. Um, and so they thought that it was safe, and it wasn't. And I think where we can work is just on, on the perceptions and helping people understand risk and threats more so than this tool is the panacea. Okay, thank you. Um, yes, I was about to say we're, we're about to open to the floor, but I'll leave, I'll leave the next comment to America. Uh, yeah, I, have, I, have, I, I want to bring it to trust and transparency um, because I think one of the, the questions in my mind, um, I, I am not a very huge proponent of re regulation, but I'm a huge proponent for measurements. And also what I see is even when protocols are designed very securely, okay, it's not necessarily the protocols that get circumvented, but equipment manufacturers who are actually building equipment that may not be as technical savvy as one would hope. And so how they've implemented the protocol that is supposed to be secure, right, they've implemented it in a way that is not secure. And also when equipment vendors ship with certain defaults, default behavior, that is not very transparent to users of this equipment. And so I think trust is really at the heart of security at all levels. Um, you know, just understanding exactly how things work, um, either from a protocol level, why certain choices have been made. There's always in the IETF a security section, security considerations, that actually discusses where some protocols may not be as secure as they could be, but the trade-offs from an engineering level were, were made, um, you know, looking at what's best for the overall um, community, right, with everybody involved in these IETF working groups. And so um, it is a very complex problem, but I think we do have to really work on the transparency as well. Constantinos? Yes, thank you, uh, Marco. Very quickly, I think we're all saying the, the same thing uh, using different words. It's all about contextualizing this thing. 
Uh, it's all about trying to, to, to make everybody understand what it is. And I would like to go back to what Marike say. I mean, trust and transparency are key features of this. And if we are, a bit, uh, if we are to judge a little bit uh, the past few months, what has been happening, the issue of transparency has been, uh, has been uh, manifested as a key driver uh, behind all this. People need, to, to the extent that it is feasible, uh, understand and know what is happening. And because you have this medium right in front of me right now, where we are all used to getting information, having access to information, when suddenly that stops due to a curtain or whatever, a wall, uh, then this creates uh, more issues. So it is very important that we try to, uh, to we see this, as far as I'm concerned, w we see this as an opportunity, an opportunity to restore trust and even go beyond the trust that existed before and also to do the same for transparency. Okay, thank you. Uh, what I would like to do is collect a few questions from the floor and then uh, we'll, uh, we'll have, uh, we get the panel a chance to uh, respond. Uh, Wout, as she your hand up. Please, please state your name and affiliation if you uh, add comments. And, and just maybe to make it a little bit more interactive, instead of having one question, one answer, one question, one answer, if we can get a handful of questions and then we can throw all those questions on the panel. And, and Thank you. My name is uh, Walt Nautis. We just did a similar panel like this just before the break and I think some of the people were in the room also. I've got one comment, two questions. Uh, I think the first one I think that you say about common values, Constantinos, is that I think that perhaps we don't have common va values here in, in the IGF because you hear very dissenting voices and there are, well, I think two major countries that don't, just don't show up here and don't say anything anymore because they've stated we want to be this different model in the UN or whatever and we're not coming here anymore. Uh, so I think it's important to understand that perhaps we don't have common values, but from there we're in the room and we still discuss things. Um, one is that the weather discussion uh, when Yari Erko presented uh, uh, as uh, chairman of the, the IETF last week in Athens at the right meeting, at a certain stage I asked him, but who is your enemy? because there were all these things going on. In the room we had the Googles, etc. all of a sudden that became an enemy because of all the data mining they do. Uh, then we had the governments that were definitely not a white elephant in the room, but they were definitely discussed there. And the third one was the, the now I'm forgetting what the third one is. Can you help me, Marco, remember? The, 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 we had the governments, we had, we had the Googles, and we had the, um, oh, sorry, I'm not wrapping it up here. I'll come back to it later. I'll go back to the other question. The other one is that, that um, we have so many different players responsible for products on ICT and, and, and the, the Internet, etc. So many layers in, in the communication that when I started to contemplate the session I was going to have, I imagined a row of a table that would be long to the end of the conference hall and we still would not have them all and half of them we could, couldn't probably not even reach because nobody knows who they are. It's just app makers somewhere in the world that shoot something into nobody knows each other and you have a new app that may be vulnerable or not and that goes just from, from play things to very serious things. Is it possible to look at the chain of the internet and see who is the dominant key player here that could actually be somehow made responsible for the security of that part of the chain? And of course that is going to be the hardest thing possible but could that be some sort of a product driver we were talking about in, 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 in the previous panel that actually said, well, if the government says this is the product I want to have, then a lot of people will follow that and then you have a higher standard because of it. But then you have to know who the key drivers are. And if I think of who's number three is, I'll come back, but it's about who is your enemy and who are you actually going to deal with first. The criminals, yes, I got it. The third one are the criminals. So we have the Googles, the criminals, and, uh, and uh, the, the, the government. Who is, your, who is your enemy, and who do you want to tackle first? And perhaps by tackling the first one, you'll discipline the rest in the direction that you uh, actually wanted to go. So your thoughts on that, please. Maybe we can do Google this week, the government next week, and then the criminals, so you can have it <laughs> um, Okay, so let's, let's get a few more questions, and we can uh, throw them at the panel. Anyone else? 
I thought I thought I saw more hands early on, but you know. got shy. Yes. Oh yes, Meredith. Hi, um, great panel. This is Meredith Whitaker from Google Research. Um, I just have a quick comment, and this might get to Robert's sort of kumbaya prescription, so I apologize. But you know, one of the things that I love about this discussion and about the sort of more the discussions that bubble up from more the, the technical community who are familiar with those processes um, is this sort of approach to transparency and uh, self-correction. So built into these processes is constant self-correction, is constant you know, steering and recalibrating based on models that are assessed you know, in reality in real time. And I think part of what, what is important there is an ability for being wrong not to be a crisis. <laughs> so you have to be able to say, I don't know, to say I was incorrect, to say that doesn't make sense, to look at the data, to look at reality, to measure that, as Mirka said, um, and to recalibrate your assumptions based on that. And I think you know, thinking about how that could, could work in a multi-stakeholder, whatever that means, uh, framework is, is a really, you know, I don't have an answer to that, but a really salutary exercise. How do governments, how do, how do regulators, how do people whose careers may be based on some you know, prescriptive idea of what needs to be done be integrated into a process that's constantly recalibrating, that you know, needs to adjust in you know, June 2013, there's a before and there's an after, and adjustments need to be made, and those need to be realistic and timely. So I, that's not a question, but uh, I, that's, that's something that I think you guys were pointing to, and I really appreciate it. Thank you. I see the gentleman here. Yeah. Patrick Jones from ICANN security team. Um, this has been good, and I wanted to raise a point that I wanted to raise in the Dutch session um, before lunch um, and didn't have a chance to raise it then, so I'm going to raise it now. Um, with national cybersecurity strategies and um, the European um, Commission's um, efforts, um, potentially bringing in internet technical operations that are globally distributed, having re these regional types of um, regulations raise challenges, so it would be good for the panel to talk about the impact of national strategies on global technical operations and a globally distributed resource. Thank you. And the lady behind you also had a question, and then we'll fold back to the to the panel to uh, some get her some responses. Uh, I'm Christine from South um, It's I think two two questions this morning. I was in a multi stakeholder panel. We we're talking a lot a bit about security in that area, but um, I think one stakeholder I'm always missing in all these areas are the software developers. We don't see them here, and, and they are the real cause. We are all here trying to, to correct something. And uh, um, every time we, we think about software vulnerabilities and problems in software, we always, the technical community, ITF developers, and, and people from networking, oh, let's create a standard to try to cope with that. But then a standard is, at the end, developed by a software developer, and more vulnerabilities are inserted. And it's, it's just a think about the whole community, whole software engineering community. They don't want to talk about security, and they are just creating, you no, know, we, we were talking about the right incentives, and one of the incentives is right. The, f the first software out is the one that's going to be adopted. The first standard out is going to be the first to be adopted. Uh, the people in universities are being taught or not taught about software security, and you have just a snowball getting worse and worse and worse. So I think this is one area that, from my perspective, as a third perspective, we try to reach, but it's one of the hardest. Uh, we have been talking to people from legal area, from policy makers, and it's, I think it's easier to reach to them than even is, is to reach to developers. And then just as a point, maybe to have a take from people from the panel, uh, something that worries me a lot is that we are seeing more and more uh, security as a scapegoat for different agendas and as a scapegoat for control measures and not for something that would actually improve security, but just not really uh, to implement different and weird things. And as you said in the opening, it's very complex. Security is not an easy area. 
Uh, it's very complex for people to understand, and then it's very complex f and very easy for people to manipulate. So I think we are in a very worrying yeah, time now that we really need to work as a community how not to let actually not have security but have a worse internet in name of security, and, and I think this is something that could come up a lot in the next few years and months. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> Hello, Jan Malinowski from the, the Council of Europe. I would like to make three quick points. I hope they are quick. Yes, I hope they are quick. The first one is that <coughs> total security doesn't exist. It always comes at the, or the, the higher security comes at the expense of a reduction in freedom, in liberty. So if you want more security, you will uh, trade off certain things that you may not always want to trade off. That's a, a blanket statement. It, uh, one can moderate it, but, but at least it, 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 is, it does give an indication of the, of the thinking. The second one is uh, that multi-stakeholderism is about dialogue. It's not about co-decision making. It's about it not even about common values. There may be certain common areas of, of agreement, but at the end of the day, uh, multi-stakeholderism is about good governance, which is about listening to the others. It's about taking into account what the others have to say in order to be better informed when taking a decision. Whoever is the relevant body or person or community that will take the decision at the end of the day. So it is a good governance issue. And the, the final one is related to, to the question of security and so on, going into, into an example to, to, to show a bit what, what I mean. Uh, crime, cybercrime, for example, it is a security issue. Now, normally, traditionally, uh, uh, the, the repression of crime is the monopoly of the state. Now, we are talking multi-stakeholderism here. How do we incorporate the, the multi-stakeholder dialogue and identifying the roles and responsibilities of different parts of the community, of the internet community, or different communities within the, the broader <coughs> uh, world of the internet in respect of combating uh, cybercrime. What I would say is, uh, if I can give an example of a tricky area where more debate needs to be had. Uh, sorry, before I go into that, uh, criminal law will never resolve crime. We know that. Criminal law puts a few people in prison, it dissuades others from doing, and it educates others. Uh, it dissuades some that would be minded to engage in, in crime, uh, not to do it. And then it uh, educates others that might have wanted to uh, engage in criminal activity that it's perhaps better not to do it. So. That is a bit the background. We know that uh, in, in any community, the vast majority of criminal activity is not tackled by the criminal law system. And it will be the same in the, in the cyber space uh, area. But one, one concrete example in the, in the criminal activity area uh, on, the, on the internet. We have the question of peaceful protest. In the physical world, <coughs> peaceful, peaceful protest has been addressed and has been uh, regulated and teased out by the, by the courts and interpreted and so on, and it has evolved over time. And peaceful protest can be disruptive and can be very annoying for some, and it can even uh, carry a price tag for those who protest and for those who are the targets of the protest. Now, that is an area which for the time being in the, in the cyberspace is considered automatically to be a criminal activity. So <coughs> any, any intervention, interference with someone else's uh, transit or website or whatever, even if it is simply to, to make a political statement, is immediately considered cybercrime. Now, that, I, I'm not trying to suggest an answer to that. It's simply to, to indicate that the answer is not yet there and that more dialogue is needed and we need to listen to each other more 
in order to come up with the, with the right answer. Thank you. Oh, a great set of questions. Uh, if other people have questions, please hold them. We'll throw them to the panelists, because so, so, there are so many questions. I'm going to try to sort of throw out some of the issues there. So, so um, um, the, the, the idea about multi-stakeholderism not being um, um, a question of common values, but I love the part you said about uh, that it's like good governance, but listening to each other. Um, but also um, the, the part about um, the, I guess the, 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 the relationship between governments and, and those in the, for example, operational community and how you get that, how you, you get gov governments and, and decisions they make into an ever-changing operational world. Um, the part about trust, I think we've touched upon that, but I think there's some, some you might have some interesting things to say about that. Um, but, but then I'd also like to put the thing about, um, so we often talk about security versus privacy. And, and you know, we have to find a balance. But, but um, I think some of the things that, that Robert touched upon was also uh, about security and anonymity in terms of privacy and, and that it can protect civil rights. So security, I in what sense, for whom, and, and um, to what end? Um, yeah, I think, I think you're ready to pound, so, so I'll let you go. I'll just maybe add something in regards to kind of trade-offs as well that haven't been mentioned, going back to the email analogy and making it difficult or not, I would say it's not just about freedom and the balance of security and freedom, but from a user perspective and just using the technology, we also have to factor in usability and convenience. Um, there's some wonderful tools out there um, but they're just so hard or they're so geeky that your average user or as the trainers usually say, the grandmoms can't use the tool, so it makes it difficult. Um, so that's maybe one thing to add. Um, another thing is uh, someone mentioned earlier something about enemies and which is the enemy of the weak. Um, but then earlier we talked about an ecosystem, and so we're all in the same bounded space together. Um, and so I think if we can talk about you know, the environment, and even though they're, they're actors, I think there might be a need sometimes to have some regulation to just regulate how the, you know, if there's something that's um, deemed a, a, an activity, but it's also the community working together. Um, and then I'm maybe going to add an explosive um, comment uh, or, or a question, just going back in terms of offline and online, and so you're talking about protests and um, all those consequences. It reminds me of something that um, I don't prescribe to, but something that some in civil society, well, if you're, if you're thinking of digital equivalents of the online space, then in the offline space, when um, those that want to um, have some sort of action and get the attention of others, they'll strike, they'll protest, and they'll barricade. And so something that's come up in the past that the technical community quivers about is, is DDoS a protest measure? Um, if, if you're going to say that or not. And so I think that's something else that if you're going to bring that up, uh, brings up a whole bunch of other things. But I think it's just bringing the, something that you mentioned, I think you quoted, and the multi-stakeholder model, you, you defined it well. But I think, too, it's also how do we bring traditional offline expressions and rights that we have and not just have it by default being secure going to prison if it's in digital. Um, so I'll, I'll, I'll maybe put that in. Hopefully, it'll be an interesting um, set of answers. All right, I'm, I'm going to address actually Walt's question, with, which was um, primarily like, does somebody own security? Should somebody be in charge? And just really quickly, I made a little list of, you know, all the, from a technical perspective, what's all involved. So, you know, you have to deal with equipment vendors, and these are your home routers, your firewalls, your switches, your routers, what have you. And then consumer electronics. My dryer will tell me whether or not, you know, it needs to be repaired. Your TVs, your music systems, your refrigerators, right? All of them are going to be on the internet. Somebody has written their software. Do we know whether or not somebody can use that in a denial of service attack? Then you've got the chip vendors, your hardware. You've got your software writers. You've got your mobile application creators. You have your protocols themselves. You have the internet service providers, you have the businesses, you have the end users, right? And there's probably a lot that I've missed. 
So I think you get the point that there are a lot of people involved and they are all responsible. We are all responsible. And if I'm at home and I have, you know, I have to be cognizant what my device does. Whoever I buy my electronics from, I drive them crazy. Because first of all, I ask, do they support IPv6? You know, they don't know what that is. But um, I do, you know. But, but, you know, and then you're trying to figure out, well, can I filter anything? They're like, what? Can I upgrade my software on this television? What? Right? And, and this, this is part of the growing problem that we really have to look at. Right? And so, and it's an expanding problem because everything is going to be on the Internet. I mean, there's just more and more things on it. And so, you know, I don't think that there's one, one entity that can be responsible, I think, collectively, right, as technologists, as policymakers, as law enforcement, we have to try and fig uh, figure out how to mitigate the risk as much as possible. And I will also echo the point um, about software development. So I have an engineering degree, and, you know, I have to take some software classes. I got a very good grade when the program gave the result that it needed, not that I did error checking, right? And I believe that this is still true today. This is the problem, okay? It starts with the education where I wish that you would get a lot of extra points the more error checking that you did. So... Anyway, that's it. Could, could I just quickly follow up on that? So, so, so you're saying that you, you do not want to be responsible for all these different, you personally. You seem like a very reasonable person. So, but, but, um, but if I, so basically you're talking about this shared responsibility that we also hear about in various contexts. We all have a shared responsibility as an end user, as a consumer, you have responsibility to do certain, to be aware of what it, what, it, what tools you're using and what you are doing, uh, and everyone through the whole value chain has responsibility. But, and that sounds great, but really, how realistic is that? My, um, my mother-in-law is 80-something. She, she's got an iPad. She doesn't know what she's doing. Um, how, you know, governments are not techies. Um, you can expect, you know, some dialogue, but really, how much responsibility can you expect them to, to take? And how, how much can you expect um, the technical community to take? And I think this has no clear delineation, um, but I will bring it back to education. I, I know a few countries that have actually spent a lot of time educating their constituents. I mean, my mother is 80 years old. And she has to do a lot of things online. And I, I will mention my background is that I'm Estonian. And so whenever she goes to Estonia, she has to renew her insurance. She has to do her banking online. She has a national ID card where she has to know that every five years she has to go to a bank and get new certificates. Right? She is able to do that without calling me. Right? And I can uh, definitively say that, you know, I have 90 gigabytes. I mean, I have a lot of data that shows all the TV shows and advertisements that they have done to educate children, older people. Usually, we're not good at doing that. There's too much jargon. And so I think educating at the level that people can comprehend, not that they need to learn the technical jargon, but we bring it into terms that they will understand. I think that's really needed. I've got a few comments online, I think, uh, Chris. Uh, we have one comment from Tatiana Trofina. Um, it's responding to uh, Mr. Malinowski's que uh, question, comment from the Council of Europe. And she says, the response is that I disagree with Mr. Malinowski. I agree that criminal law cannot solve the problems, but the absence of clear substantive and procedural frameworks in this field is bringing us to the problems. If we do not regulate there, if we do not have, let's say, a framework for access to metadata or content of communication for investigation, the certain, then certain types of crime we will end up with a grey area where governments and LEAs can collect whatever data with little or no judicial oversight and, as in, the, as in Mr Malinowski's example, make it a crime to protest. This is the issue about criminal law. It does not solve a problem, but we need clear frames does not solve a problem, but we need clear frameworks to separate crime from other activities 
and to implement safeguards, protecting rights of the citizens during crime investigation and, which is even more important now, during crime detection and crime prevention. It's about the prim entity primary respons primarily responsible for security. We know that the value chains transferred to value networks and there are so many players on the ICT markets, from the software developers to vendors, operators, app developers, etc., etc., etc. This is now, this is not the value chain anymore, this is a value network. And that is why we are talking about multi-stakeholder, actually. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, uh, Pete and uh, Constantine, and then we'll go then back to the room to uh, so get our responses. I, I would love to go on about software developers because it, it's part of my day job, but it would take too long, so I, I'll take that outside of the room. The two things I wanted to address, um, uh, two comments that I think tie together, the who is your enemy issue and the thing that Meredith brought up about self-correction built into the process. I, in the engineering end of the world, in, in the standards making in the technical community, one of the things that we've been pushing for with the recent revelations, with um, all of these issues is we have to separate out some of the panic and some of the screaming from what needs to be done. One of the things I think that's important is actually ignoring who the enemy is and focusing on what's the threat we're trying to avoid. And, and because noting who the enemy is sort of focuses everybody on that darn U.S. government which is doing all that evil stuff, that's not a way to move forward the technology. What is is, okay, do, do we want to avoid active, passive sniffing of our data? Do we want to avoid um, folks who are willing to infiltrate our computers as opposed to just look at the network? Um, those are the kinds of questions that we need to ask. And hopefully those protocols are built in such a way where we can say, oh, new threat, okay, we adjust the protocol in this particular way and make that correction. Um, so I think those kinds of uh, abilities are what the technical community is good at to avoid some of the hysteria. Um, the other comment I wanted to get at, uh, the, the poor chap in the corner who, who everybody is going to disagree with, but um, there, there, there was a comment that I found very odd. He said, total security doesn't exist. I agree with that. That's, that's certain. And um, I think trying to build that perfect security protocol is a horrible failure every time. But then he said, you always have to trade off, and I was expecting the next word to be performance or uh, something else, which I have some disagreements with, but he said, you have to trade off freedom. And I thought, my, depends on what you mean by freedom. Because, of course, increasing security preserves many freedoms. And, and um, so I, I, I think a lot of that has to do with the framing of um, what the problem is. So, okay, so we may be in violent agreement as he shakes his head up and down. Uh, violent agreement is something in the IETF we do quite often. Um, and I, I think one of the things that um, the technical community needs to keep in mind is that, again, these are tools that we are providing to folks for different uses. Uh, the lack of encryption helps certain folks for certain sometimes very important things. We uh, know businesses for whom they want to do mass searches over data um, in order to prove that they are um, the owner of this uh, uh, you know, particular uh, uh, piece of information or that they are the, uh, uh, you know, that they can prove that they said this some time ago in court. Um, having that all encrypted makes that much more difficult. So it's important for people to be able to quickly find things and not rely on, do I still have the keys? Um, but we need to provide the tools such that when I do want to lock this stuff down so that no one else can view it but me, when I do want perfect forward secrecy so that no one can prove that I said it, um, these are important tools and things that we have to provide for the purposes when people want to use them. Okay. Cool. Yes, uh, very quickly, uh, I would like to respond mainly to the issue of uh, 
common values, and uh, I would respectfully uh, disagree. Uh, I think that we actually do have one common value, and yes, maybe not every single one of us, but uh, to use uh, an ITF uh, term, we have consensus that we need to protect the Internet the way it works. And um, uh, on that basis, we also need to understand that we are, uh, we are living very challenging times. And um, I don't think that uh, assigning key players to deal with security are going to solve this. And I think that Pete actually just said it and I noted down. We haven't seen the technical community through all this process panicking. And I, 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 I think this is wonderful because they actually are the ones that they understand better the ins and outs and the technical details of what has actually happened. And the fact that we have a community that really understands the issue, yet again, they maintain their calmness, for me, I feel secure because I know that uh, they are thinking of things, they are deliberating, they are discussing them, and they're going to... And they're going to bring them back because of this need to actually find solutions and for, the, of, and for ensuring this uh, common value. So uh, I would like to, I said it before and I would like to repeat myself that this is a great opportunity. Uh, it provides us, uh, if you want, um, a gateway to greater means of cooperation, to strengthen the cooperation, that, because I don't believe that there is no cooperation, but I just believe that it provides the gateway to strengthening the cooperation and actually building those bridges that this AGF uh, is meant to be talking about. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I'm going to do a quick round of responses from the floor, but uh, please do keep in mind we're under a time constraint. I want to throw in a quick question, oh. if I may. <laughs> okay, so it's almost like you, you're sitting singing Kumbaya together, so, so I'm going to uh, be a voice of, of uh, dissent. Um, so everyone agrees that security um, is a great thing, but is it really? I mean, security, do we really need security? Isn't, isn't there a risk that uh, by you know, trying to secure parts of the internet more and more, we give the illusion that it's secure? You know, we talked about this thing about you know, there's no perfect, um, there's no total security, if you can use that, uh, that term. But security, security is, is, is not all great. It's difficult. It's hard to use. It costs a lot of money. Isn't it better that we just all agree that what's on the internet is public? People sh happily share all sorts of things on Facebook. I, if we just all agree that it's on, if it's on the internet, it's public, so it's not secure, and as long as people are educated on that, you know, we're all fine. Very quickly, and I would like to add something as well. The, uh, on, on your list of things, expensive, whatever, it can also be misused. Tools that we're creating to secure communications and to what's happening on the Internet have a flip side. They can be taken by whoever and be mis uh, misused and, uh, as tools for censorship for many, many things that we really do not want to see. So yes, security comes with its own tricks and uh, challenges. Uh, and You're not supposed to agree with me. I know. So, but, but at the same time, I cannot, I, I cannot accept that we don't need security. And I keep on hearing all the time the, 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 the Facebook story that, yes, you know, we're giving away information. I think that one of the things that the Internet has done is the fact that it has actually loosened up and at the same time uh, um, made it uh, stronger what we mean by privacy and how each one of us define privacy. So, yes, the, the younger generation that is using the f Facebook have no understanding of the kind of privacy that I have. So we make different uses. And for them, this is okay because that's how they're growing up. Whether it's good or bad, only history can tell. Depending on where you come, your persuasions, your views on privacy, things might change. But the idea of giving up security or not even trying to address the security challenges for me, rests in, an, uh, in an a little bit uncomfortable place. I, I will disagree with you. <laughs> I'd love to disagree with you. <laughs> um, and the reason why is because what people don't understand is that security is only really complex if you put more and more mitigation techniques in there. 
because of the fact that Pete is not giving me his laptop and letting me type on it, he's, he's creating some security around that, okay? And so we, when we think about it, right, I mean, um, we actually do provide security. The people that are creating our networks, they don't just let it be a free fall. You know, they usually have, have people authenticate before they get access somewhere. And while these are minimal risk mitigation techniques, they are risk mitigation techniques. And the thing around security and what makes it so complex is that you have to understand all of the ways that somebody can circumvent the, the techniques that you're putting in so that they can get access to the data or in, impersonate you or, you know, make services unavailable. And the details are what's complex. So you, you, you don't have a free fall no matter what you do, even your TV vendors, right? It's not like I can go and reprogram some of the parameters. The vendor will do that for me very happily, mm -hmm. right? But so, so you don't have a free, no secure internet um, just at the get-go. I've got three flags in the room, I think. So Robert and Robert wants to comment. Just a quick comment. I, I heard your question, and I also heard kind of it translated in my mind to, well, what do we have to hide? I mean, why should we use security? We should all be open. And I was just trying to think in terms of maybe a, another way to, to answer it, is I think is that if, if that's your premise, then you're expecting that we're not going to do anything with the data, that it will just sit out there. And so you're assuming perhaps that there's no malevolent actors, that um, people won't care in terms of the sensitivity of the data, but people do expect um, some sort of protections. And now again, going back to the earlier definition, which was they, um, people sometimes expect to be um, safe from danger and threats. And so um, if you want your, on, your offline protections that we all have, because they're universal of privacy, freedom of expression, and association, you do realize that um, just, you know, you, when you want to have a conversation um, with a, you know, uh, about a business uh, deal. So, for example, it would be very different, and for example, bringing in ICANN a little bit, but in, a, in an interesting way, is there's a lot about the new GTLD process, there's a lot of companies bidding. Well, imagine if every single part of that process was completely public, including the negotiations. Um, we would be in a very different position right now, so there's an expectation that certain things need to be private. And so it's, I think the same thing is just that if you want certain rights, then um, you, you deserve a certain level of, of security, and they go hand in hand and not one against the other. Okay, I'll sink them by on my own here then. Okay. There are a few uh, more questions. Yeah, and for the, for the, the sake of time, uh, please, please be, try to be brief. Yeah, Jan, Phyllis, I'm going to take two out, and unless somebody else has anything urgent. Then we'll fold it back. Okay, and somebody in the back, and then we'll leave the last words to the panel. Jan, go ahead. Yes, I, I, I said that I was going to be very short, and because of that, I didn't say the, the elements that you complimented, uh, uh, that Tatiana, uh, Robert, and yourself uh, supplemented, added to what I would have wanted to say. I would have wanted to say much more <laughs> in addition to that. Thank you. Phyllis, and please, please state your name and affiliation if you comment. Sure. Phyllis Yilmaz, uh, ISOC ambassador, speaking on her behalf, herself, obviously. Um, uh, and I don't want an answer, really. I just want to throw this out there because this is uh, the end session that I'm attending, that these issues are being uh, talked about, and they're all obviously uh, tangential to each other. Uh, one thing was raised. I, I truly believe in the trust issue. I think it's, there is a long way there to build up. but. Uh, it seems to me like when people are talking, um, there seems to be trust issue towards uh, to the governments from the technical community, from governments towards the technical co community, and there is, I think, there is the one issue angle there over in between the users. Um, at the moment, the users, I don't know how where to trust those users. They, we don't know where to trust. I might be given under after all this. I might be given some piece of uh, 
protection mechanism on my laptop which will assure me by some techie that I will be protected, but how do I know it is not uh, serving to a piece of surveillance act? And fair enough, there is some um, thoughts that needs to be put on the government level, but I think technical community, and I'm part of that, I see myself as part of that, we have a long way to think through about this issue too, how, how do we have that trust being put back towards our side, ourselves as well. Thank you. Wout? Wout Tenatis, just representing myself at the moment. Um, I think the final question, I think we talked about white elephants. There's a major white elephant in the room that nobody's mentioned because half of the questions and half of the comments go towards government. So why isn't there a, a, a government represented in the panel? Because then they could answer the questions and the comments. We, do, we did actually ask some people, some governments, uh, to participate, and I know that without putting anyone on the spot, I asked some, some government representatives to be in the room. Maybe if they want to comment, I can just leave it open to them. Okay, I, 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 see, I see somebody in the back now, wiggling, but uh, let, let me take the question from the gentleman in the back hand first. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. I am Benny. Uh, from a ministry coordinator, political justice and security affair. Uh, uh, but I'm sorry because my English is uh, not good. But I try to uh, make a question: uh, How to draw system pattern about cyber security? Although in this uh, meeting we say about uh, internet security. Uh, when when I follow uh, meet every meeting or uh, seminar in in my country, uh, the important things is uh, how how to draw system pattern about cyber security. Why? Because all uh, all ministry or institution uh, in my country. Uh, 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 said that this is my domain, like uh, 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 defense ministry. He said that uh, uh, cyber defense is his domain, and cyber crime uh, police department said his domain. Uh, but uh, when we uh, try to to analyze, uh, because uh, Ministry Coordinator Political Justice and Security Affairs uh, always look uh, the the policy. This is uh, already running well or no? Because we, if we didn't have uh, uh, know uh, how to draw the same way about pattern uh, cyber security, security, this is a uh, relation with uh, how to to make education policy or regulation. This is relation with this this uh, uh, this three factor. Uh, maybe uh, I want know from this uh, uh, meeting uh, how should we know how we have same uh, view about about cyber security uh, pattern. Thank you. Well, Thank great you. comments. Maybe not just multi stakeholder cooperation, but cooperation within that the same stakeholder group. We are, um, we've got one last comment, I think. We are running out of time. I hate to cut this discussion because I think this is, it's, it is starting to get interesting. We'll take the comments and then we'll let the panelists do a final quick. Okay, the last comment is from, um, here from, is from Kimo Okunimi, our, our absent panelist, or online panelist. He says, quick comment. We are talking about cyberspace and crimes in internet forgetting that they are in fact happening somewhere and that place usually has laws. The problem with cyber crimes is that not every country has a national legislation about cyber crimes and all countries don't want to regulate cyber crimes the same way. I think that is a good question, should we, should we try to secure internet or not? Although it's the same question that we should try to secure our daily life outside of the internet. I think nobody is seriously thinking of giving up in securing the internet more and more of our daily life will be in the internet. Shopping, schools have tests and grades, cars are connected to the internet, 
people are more and more dependent on the internet and we should try to make the internet safer for all the people. Governments and private sector are, mo are motivated to work together for safer cyberspace. Thank you. And last round of comments from the panel. Let's re so we just start with Robert and work towards you, Nurani. If you could all please just use minus three minutes each. Uh, maybe a tweet. Great conversation, um, good dialogue. I think a lot of things have been said, so I'll just finish in saying um, ways. Th the other thing th for the multi-stakeholder model that's key around these issues is that the conversation needs to take place in a continuing basis, not just once a year. Very quickly myself as well. I think. You've nailed the uh, you've hit the nail on the head when you said this is what the tenth, twentieth cybersecurity session. Without this platform, none of these discussions would be taking place. So please, the, uh, I want to believe that this is a shaping uh, 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 forum of ideas that you all can take and start working uh, through cooperation and through collaborative channels in order to instill the trust, go back and make things more transparent and start understanding better cybersecurity issues. We're going to be mimicking each other. I do believe that we have to continue the collaboration. I also think that there's not just one owner in security in any country. And so just cooperation and dialogue needs to continue. Thank you. And I, I think uh, it, it's always terrible when the, the last few comments from the floor are exactly the ones that you could go on for hours about. Um, but uh, I, I think one of the interesting things that came out of the spam and cybercrime session yesterday was that there are great opportunities for education. Some of those are very straightforward, how to use the tools that are available, what to do. But some of the other education that I think needs to take place is educating each other, each of the stakeholders, on what their particular expertise is and how to transfer that. And I think Medico, uh, uh, Medica said, um, I'll just mush your two names together. <laughs> it's much easier that way. Um, I, I think Medica said earlier that the idea of figuring out whose responsibility each piece was is an important piece of the educational process that the technical people have to educate, the government people have to educate the user community, uh, the, the civil society in effect, and that the education has to go back the other way. How are your tools being used? What are they being used for? By whom? Um, and, and I think that gets at some of the answer, um, which I wish we could go into more, about how do you get these different parts of even government to agree on which part they have responsibility for. These are wonderful questions. Okay. We have, I don't know if this is quite a conclusion, but we're working with a bit of a time difference here. <laughs> Tatiana said, and this is in reference, I think, to Kimo's statement a little earlier, I disagree. In substantive criminal law, many countries, almost every country, has legislation on cybercrime and is more or less harmonized. The problem is procedural frameworks, and that's where we have to put our efforts. She notes, this is a comment coming from someone who did a study for the UNODC and analyzed legislation in more than 130 countries. We do have legislation on what crime is. We do even have it harmonized. We need to protect rights and implement safeguards during the crime investigations and implement the frameworks that we use for investigation. Because it was surprising for me, for example, at Europol, Interpol conference, that even the police do not know what instruments they have according to the Cybercrime Convention. Yeah, thank you. Um, I think we're going to wrap it up here. So. Uh, and, and I would like to add then one final closing comment. Indeed, let's, uh, let's continue this dialogue uh, during coffee and tonight during dinner and everywhere else we can. Uh, thank you all for being here. Uh, a special thanks to our panelists for joining, sometimes at the rather last minute. And, uh, of course, thank you for uh, Tatjana and Kimo for uh, your online participation. It uh, was for you uh, quite an early hour. So uh, thank you all. And, uh, Hope to uh, meet you around. Thanks.